believe the God of the Bible is the only true God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. I believe God is involved in and cares about my daily life. I believe a person comes into a right relationship with God by God's grace through faith in Jesus Christ. I believe the Bible is the Word of God and has the right to command my belief and action. I believe I am significant because of my position as a child of God. Hello, Westside Family Church. It is so great to see you. A shout out to those of you who are here in the North Sanctuary, the South Sanctuary. Always a shout out to those who are watching online, including one of our own Westsiders, uh, Cassie and Jared Furman are in Cabo, Mexico. Let's give it up to them as they watch online. And uh, come on, we could do better than that. Woo! Little jealousy that they're down by the beach, I get that, but they're our brother and sister, so let's give it up for them. If you uh, brought your Believe book or Bible, I'm going to invite you to hold it high over your head. You're going to need that every single week, okay? We need that to go up a little bit next week. If you don't know what this is all about, uh, chat with your neighbor who has one, and you can still get on this amazing journey. Um, I want you to see this quote uh, that uh, I've shared with you before, but it's going to sort of lay the groundwork for our time together today. This is a statement by George Gallup Jr. in a book he wrote called The People's Religion, which is a summary of the state of American spirituality. Take a look at this. The churches in America face no greater challenge than overcoming biblical illiteracy, and the prospects for doing so are formidable because the stark fact is many Christians don't know what they believe or why. Our faith is not rooted in Scripture. We revere the Bible, but don't read it. Some observers maintain that the Bible has not in any profound way penetrated our culture. That comment haunts me as a pastor, that this could be happening under my watch as a leader in the United States. So we have developed a passion here at Westside Family Church, a deep conviction that we're going to do something about this, to change this, at least here at Westside Family, that the people who call this place home will know what they believe and why and will have the ability to articulate it. This is one of the primary passions of this series called Believe, that when you are asked a question, an important question, you'd be able to give an answer for the hope that is within you. If you are a guest today, uh, we are on a journey to actually articulate uh, what we believe and why, along with the key scripture to go with it, and I'm hoping that the Westside family is staying with us on this journey, because we're going to rehearse where we're at so far, and you can join us in this journey. If someone asks you the question, who is God, what would you say? Ready? I believe the God of the Bible is the only true God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Back that up with scripture. Ready? May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. 2 Corinthians 13, 14. The follow-up question is, but does he care about me? What would be your answer? I believe God is involved in and cares about my daily life. Passage of scripture to back that up. I lift up my eyes to the mountains. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. Psalm 121, 1 and 2. Oh, but then the follow-up question is, how do I have a relationship with this God? What would your answer be? I believe a person comes into a right relationship with God by God's grace through faith in Jesus Christ. Oh, back that one up with scripture. Ready? For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this not from yourself. It is a gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. Oh, now here's an important question. But how do I know this God and his will for my life? What would be your response? I believe the Bible is the inspired word of God that guides my belief and actions. Back that one up with scripture, ready? All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped 
for every good work. 2 Timothy 3, chapter, verses 16 and 17. Way to go, church. I'm going to invite you to memorize just five more after the one you've memorized today. And if you're visiting with us, we'd love for you to get on this journey to finally be able to articulate after years and years of sitting in pews and church seats, you finally be able to give an answer to what you believe and why it matters. That seems important to me. Today, we're going to unlock door number five with the answer to this key question, who am I? Who am I? These first four beliefs that we have covered in scriptures have really laid the foundation to give the answer to this question. And your answer from your heart to this question is going to be the driver of the very quality of your life. Now, to help us understand what the scriptures has to say about this particular question, I felt today that one of the best ways to help us get a deeper understanding is to provide an example of how this works out in earthly relationships, and then I'll turn around and teach you what this means about our relationship with God and how it defines who we are. So I'm gonna interview a guy today that many of you know. He is our family pastor, who has a story that you may have never heard. His name is John Huber, Pastor John Huber. So uh, let's welcome him to the stage as he shares his story. There we go. Good morning. Good morning, John. In addition to being our awesome family pastor, uh, anybody knows you won't be offended that I say this, a quite crazy man. I am. It's a true statement. It's a true statement, which we appreciate. Yeah. You have a... There's more to your story. There is. So tell us a little bit about it. Yeah. Yeah, yesterday I was thinking about my story, and, and, uh, and I love this church. I love Westside Family Church. I love seeing all of you come in uh, each week. Um, but part of my story that many of you don't know is uh, I grew up in and out of foster homes. Um, and this is why I'm, today I'm so passionate about families. And so I want to take um, just the next few minutes and share a very uh, condensed version of my life story. And uh, if you want to take me to lunch or coffee, I will share the rest of it in detail, okay? <laughs> Just like Pastor Randy, I'll probably forget my wallet, so um, it, it will be on you. Uh, but let me begin. Um, from birth to three years old, uh, I lived with my birth mother and her boyfriend. Um, and, and much of what I know, uh, I read about uh, when I was 22 years old, in a, in a document from Children, uh, they, they called it CYS, Children uh, Services in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And I discovered uh, a lot of what I don't remember. Uh, I have a twin sister. And so from uh, birth to three, we lived with my mother. But we were taken to the hospital uh, where uh, Child Protective Services got involved because uh, my sister and I had uh, been abused and uh, severely malnutritioned. Uh, so we both had broken bones, and, uh, and we were uh, not fed right. And so uh, at that point, we were taken away from my birth mother. I've never met my natural birth father. And uh, so through that process, uh, we were placed from three to eight years old in a foster family. Uh, and from three to eight, we had a normal life. You know, we were involved in sports. Uh, we had a great, uh, I had five other siblings that were a part of that family, my twin sister and I together. And so everything was normal up until the age of eight when my foster parents sat us down and said, hey, uh, we're getting a divorce. And at the time, they didn't allow single parent foster homes because my foster father really wanted to keep my sister and I. And I remember this conversation. I remember sitting on the couch and, and at eight, you don't really comprehend too many things. Um, but I remember looking into my foster father's eyes and thinking, well, we have to leave. We've got to leave this home. And, and so Child Protective Services came and they picked us up. And I remember my sister and I sitting in the back seat driving away. Um, and I thought, wow, uh, I may never see them again. And, and so through, uh, from 8 to 15, uh, we lived in three other foster families. And uh, the one thing that, that you need to know about the story, my foster father uh, was always committed to um, staying connected to my sister and I. He never missed a birthday. He never missed a holiday. 
Um, and and I, if truth be known, I was always excited because he always put a nice wad of cash uh, <laughs> in, the, uh, in the envelope and, and with the card. And so at 15, I found myself, we were in a foster home. Actually, my sister at 13, was, uh, she was pretty uh, wild and crazy, wilder and crazier than me, wow. I know. Um, and so she was actually taken out of our foster family, and it was the first time we were separated. Um, so that was, that's a different story, and I'll circle around to that in a moment. But at 15, I found myself uh, in trouble. I played sports, and that actually is one thing that I think kept me alive. Um, I wrestled, I played football, and, and so when I was 15, I was at a party, and I came home, and uh, you know, at, at those kind of parties, I, I was pretty uh, intoxicated, and my foster mother uh, started yelling at me, and she grabbed me and by my shirt and, and pushed me up against the wall, and, and I reacted. I pushed back, and, uh, and so she called the police and uh, you know, basically said, hey, you need to come and get him. And, uh, and so I found myself arrested at 15. Um, and so I was back into, uh, it was called a detention center. And that was on a Friday. On Monday, I had a court hearing. And I'll never forget this moment as long as I live. And if, if you know anything about uh, foster care and residential treatment, uh, a 15-year-old male um, really has little chances of being successful because the odds are stacked against them. And so on Monday, uh, I show up in court and I'm standing there with my case manager, the family court judge, and in walks my original foster father. And I'll never forget this day, he stood next to me. And little did I know, um, he had been following and my foster parent had contacted him, uh, the one that called the police on me, contacted him and said, hey, I just want you to know. And here he shows up in court and he stands next to me and he said, it's going to be okay. Yeah. And what I didn't know is he had contacted the case manager. He sat down with the judge and he asked the judge uh, for um, permission to become my, my legal guardian. You see, he knew something at that time. He, he knew even though he was a single man and he had the means and, and, uh, and had the heart and compassion to uh, stand there and, and say, I'll, I'll, I'll take him. Um, it, it was a life-changing moment for me. It was a life-changing moment because he stood there and he said, um, I, I want to take him home. And so at 15 years old, um, the judge said, your best chance is going to be with him. And he asked me, do, do you want to go? The judge said, do you want to go? And I'm thinking juvenile detention or like a, a, a warm shower and a good meal tonight. So I'm like, uh, yeah. And so that, that's part of my story. And, and from 15 to 18 is when it became real because uh, here I am uh, living with him and I, I went through high school. And when I was 18, I was at another party. I'm, I'm sorry to say this and... and Parents, if you have teenagers, this is why I'm so passionate about teenagers. Um, I was wild and crazy, and, and I believe the church is the biggest, um, has the biggest opportunity to influence uh, middle schoolers and high schoolers. And so when I was 18, I had a party at, at my dad's house, and somebody uh, drove their car over the hillside, and so the police came, and uh, once again, I found myself in trouble. And, uh, and so my dad sat me down, and, and I said to him, I said, listen, I'll, I'll, I'll pack my stuff. And he said, you're not packing your stuff. He goes, you're staying here. He goes, you're going to own, um, you're part of this incident. You're going to pay the $800 fine, and, uh, and I love you unconditionally. Mm -hmm. And so uh, that summer, uh, I went and I served at a camp, and I gave my life to the Lord uh, that summer, I was 18 years old, and I said to him, Lord, I'll go wherever you send me, and I'll do whatever you ask me to do. And so here I sit today. My sister, my twin sister, ended up marrying a pastor. <laughs> yeah, I mean, and uh, just, uh, and she has five kids. I stopped at two. Um, and uh, the one thing that I say to my boys every single night, uh, I made a commitment when I had my, my children I promised them they would never question my love for them, 
and my commitment as a father. And as I leave each of the rooms every night, my four-year-old doesn't really understand, but my 11-year-old does. I ask him who he is every night. And he says, I'm a child of the one true king. Mm. And I say to him, that is correct. Mm -hmm. And nobody can ever take that away from you. And that means more to you coming from your story of feeling lost and maybe rejected, abandoned, woe is me. Uh, you feel more deeply about that. Uh, this guy's name is Chuck, yeah. right? Yep. Charles Chuck. Yep. But you call him. Dad. And he calls you. Son. Let's give it up for John. That's There's a, a picture of them with their Royals jerseys all over them, and uh, that's a picture of a man who rescued a boy who, at, a, at, at, at the age of 15, his statistical chances of having a family are basically zero. It's a story of redemption. It's a story that God has for each of us. So, uh, and now, and now with that story in your heart, I want to teach you uh, from this chapter today what the Word of God teaches us. First of all, we are taught in scriptures that we are spiritual orphans. We are spiritual orphans. If you have your believe book, you can turn to page 87 and you'll find it also in uh, Ephesians chapter 2 verses 11 through 13. Paul writes, therefore remember that formerly you who are Gentiles by birth and called uncircumcised by those who call themselves the circumcision which is done in the body by human hands. Remember at that time you were separate from Christ, excluded from citizenship in Israel and foreigners to the covenants of the promise, without hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. The scripture teaches that we were all born on the outside looking in, we were excluded. We were spiritual orphans. But Jesus made this promise in John chapter 14 and verse 18. Take a look at this. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. So we're spiritual orphans. But God has provided a way for us to be adopted. For us to be adopted. Uh, some international adoptions cost upwards to $40,000 plus dollars to redeem just one child from oftentimes a very difficult situation. But our spiritual adoption came at the price of God the Father sacrificing his own son on a cross to make the payment for our adoption. May we never forget the depths of the payment that has been made for us. I want you to listen to Ephesians chapter one, verses three through five. Take a look at this. Praise be to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love, he predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and his will. <laughs> Let's unpack that. As soon as Adam and Eve fell in the Garden of Eden and separated their life from God, God had it in mind to adopt us back. He chose us. Oh, don't let those words escape you. He chose you. It was in his heart to do this. It was not a burden, but it was his passion. It was his pleasure. It was his will. Romans says, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. We are like John Huber as a teenager. We are ornery. We get into trouble. We drink and we do all the wrong things. And yet in that state, when we are least likely to be adopted because we're not that lovable, God says, I still love you and I want to bring you home. But we have to say yes. Remember the judge with uh, John in the courtroom said, John, do you want this? John had to say yes in order for the adoption papers to be legal. And so it is with Christ. And the Bible teaches at the moment that we say yes 
and the adoption papers are signed, the Bible teaches that the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity, is deposited in our life as a mark, as a seal, as an adoption certificate, giving us the confidence that in fact this has taken place. I want you to look on page 86 of your Believe book, or Romans chapter 8 and verse 15, um, for this next passage of scripture, where Paul writes, it's in the bold type at the top of the page, the spirit you received does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the spirit you received brought about, say it with me, your adoption to sonship. Your adoption to sonship. So we are not only adopted, but next we receive a new name. When you trust Christ, you get a new name, and this leads us to the key verse that we've invited you to memorize. I'm gonna give you a chance at the end to say it again, but it comes from the lips of Jesus, John chapter one and verse 12. If you know it, say it with me. Now let's take it off the screen, if you don't mind backstage. Let's take it off, let's see if they can do it without it. There we go, you ready? ready? Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to be called children of God. Now you can put it on the screen and see if they got it right. There you go. I mean, listen to the words of Jesus. He said, yet to all who did receive him, so you have to say yes, to those of you who believed in his name, listen to, he gave you the right to be called children of God. And because of the adoption as children of God, Romans chapter eight, verse 15, it's also found on page 86 of your Believe book, Paul says, by him we cry, Abba, Father, which in the original language means that because we said yes, because we believed in him, because we did receive him, we now have the right to call the God of the universe, Daddy. <laughs> that is insane, right? Are you grasping what I'm saying? that we're ornery sinners, we are not lovable, we should not have any statistical chance of being adopted by squat nobody. But the God of the universe, it was in the pleasure of his goodwill to receive us even in our state of sin, and he gives us the right, the holy God gives us the right to call him, come on, daddy. Golly, that's crazy. But not only do we have a new name, but we are heirs. We are heirs. Listen to Ephesians chapter one, verses 13 and 14. And you also were included in Christ when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation. When you believed, you were marked in him with a seal, a promised, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of his glory. If you have your Believe book, you can turn to page 90 and you can see what uh, Peter says in chapter one, reaffirming what Paul said. At the very top of the page, it says, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish spoil or fade. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you who through faith are shielded by God's power unto the coming of salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. Bottom line, if you are a Christian, listen to this, you're loaded. I'm not just talking about spiritual blessing this time. Yeah, we receive every spiritual blessing, the scripture says, but there's also a lot of cash. God owns it like all. You are not filthy rich. You are squeaky clean rich, if you will, as followers of Jesus Christ. You have got it all. You don't now have access to this part of your inheritance until you come of age, which happens when Christ returns and we enter into the new kingdom. Right now, you don't believe it. You're just getting by, you say. But when that day comes, you're going to receive your full inheritance. And I think we are going to be shocked by how much God actually has. Now, one last one. 
As a matter of fact, it's the last one just for our time together today. In reality, there's a guy named Neil Anderson who went through the scriptures, the New Testament, and identified 33 things that happened to us when we receive Christ as Savior. I'm just covering a couple of them so we could go on for hours, but this last one is simply you receive a future. You have a future. When John Huber was back in the detention center facing a very bleak future, uh, he had no future. Uh, and he was rescued and was given a future. And now today he is amongst us as a dad, as a husband, and as the family pastor of Westside Family Church, encouraging and bringing hope to families today. I want you to listen to what John says in 1 John chapter 3, verses 1 through 20. See what great love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it does not know him. Dear friends, now that we are children of God and what we will be has not been yet been made known, but we know that when Christ appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Right now, if Prince Harry or Prince William walked into the back of the room, everyone would take note and swarm around them because we know who they are. Their grandmother is the Queen of England. They are somebody, and we would pay attention to that. For us, we know that they're royalty, but so are we. But the reality is today, when a Christian walks into the room, John says, the world doesn't circle around us like we're prince or princesses because they don't know God. They don't know who he is. But one day, they will. When King Jesus returns, it will become clear to everyone, not only that he is a somebody, but that we are his children, and they'll swarm around us and say, I never knew who you were. You are a prince. You are a princess. Listen carefully to what Peter writes in chapter two of his first book, verses nine and 10. Lean in. But you are chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Which leads us to our key idea today. The summary, the thing we want you to be able to articulate about who you are. If someone asks you, who are you? You should say, can you say it with me? I believe I am significant because of my position as a child of God. It is your right, Jesus said. But here's my challenge to you. Don't live like spiritual orphans, but live as children of God. Now, this is gonna be highly uncomfortable for you, and I invite you online to do it as well. I want you to turn to your neighbor. I know it's gonna feel uncomfortable and say, I'm a somebody. Go ahead, go ahead. I know it's gonna feel uncomfortable. Let's say it, do it, okay? I'm a somebody, okay? Now, I want you to do it again, but this time I want you to do it like you mean it, and I'm gonna give you this one time. You don't wanna do this once you leave this room, but I want you to do it with some attitude, okay? <laughs> Ready? I am a somebody. Ready, do it, come on. I am a somebody. One more time. I am a somebody. I love it. You're gonna to have to learn to wear this because John says this is who you are. You are somebody. There's a true story of a homeless man by the name of Tim Gray who was found dead a couple of years ago under a bridge, actually under the Pacific Railroad overpass in Evanston, Wyoming. He died alone and he died penniless. But it turned out that he was the adopted great-grandson of the U.S. Senator William Andrew Clark who was a copper king in Montana, diversified into banking and building railroads. He may have actually built the railroad that his great-grandson died under, and he was the founder of Las Vegas, and Timothy Gray died without realizing that he was the heir to an estate worth over 300 
million dollars. I don't want you to do that. I have a little drawing here, and let's say this is you, and this is the journey that we are on of a person the best that I can draw. And the journey that we're on through Believe is to first of all help you understand an idea in your head. Spiritual journey begins by understanding in your mind. And some of you, these ideas that we're covering, you're moving closer, but you don't yet have an understanding in your mind. And even those of you who have been followers of Christ for a long time, as we go over this, you're getting a deeper and deeper understanding as you open up your mind to the truths of God's word. But understanding it in your mind, we've told you over and over again, does not bring about transformation. It doesn't change who you are until it makes this 12-inch journey to your heart. And this is also a very, very difficult spiritual journey, and it goes deep into the heart. Once it is in the heart, then we actually believe it. Once we believe it, we start living out the truth of this. George Gallup, in a book he wrote called The Saints Among Us, did research on this and discovered that only 13% of the people that are sitting in churches today, only 13% have got to this place. I want all Westsiders to be named amongst the 13%. For you to not live as Tim Gray, to live penniless and homeless like you're not children of God, but I want you to live the rest of your life with the reality that, say it with me, I am significant because of my position as a child of God. Let's say the verse together. Yet, yet to all who did receive it, to those who believed in his name, He gave the right to be called children of God. Amen. Father, I thank you for your word today. May this truth sink deep into the minds and most importantly into the hearts of those who are in this room, those who are hearing these words, so that they might actually not live as spiritual orphans, but they may live as children of God, for that is who they are. And Father, if there's anyone hearing my words that has not yet received it, who have not believed in him, who have not signed the adoption papers, I pray that today, Father, that they will realize that they can be a somebody in you. Through Jesus Christ we pray, amen. Thank you for joining us for this message from Westside Family Church. We're on a journey of discovering how to think, act, and be more like Jesus. If you've been impacted by what God is doing through the Believe journey, We'd love to hear from you. Share your story at westsidefamily.church forward slash we believe. These stories are incredibly encouraging to both our staff and our church family. If you'd like to invest in what God is doing through Westside, you can give online at westsidefamily.church forward slash give. Thank you so much for watching.